Good night, Facebook. As usual, it's a pleasure to be with you once again to uh, engage you in another one of my provocative teachings. Uh, I'm kind of tired, but I have a lot to do tomorrow, <laughs> so I figure my best bet is to get this video out tonight so that I won't have to be dealing with this tomorrow. Now, before I get into this teaching tonight, and, and before I get into what I'm about to say next, our teaching tonight is on uh, the spiritual implications of eating in a dream. W what does that mean? You know, I meet many people that tell me all the time, Kevin, man, I'm always eating in my dreams. And they ch chuckle about it, they laugh about it, not knowing the, the significance spiritually of what such a dream carries. But before we get into that, let me just get two things out of the way. Tomorrow, for those of you that live here in the Bahamas, and especially those that live here in Freeport, Grand Bahama, where I live, uh, tomorrow morning, I will be on the local radio, 8.10 a.m. ZNS. I'll be on from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. We'll be doing a, a teaching, and uh, that teaching is called Facing Your Past facing your past. It has a lot to do with uh, generational stuff, generational curses, but not your basic teaching of generational curses. The idea of this particular teaching that we're going to be doing on ZNS 8, 10 a.m. tomorrow is for many of you, actually, that are just into the new year. God has spared your life. You're, you're here with everybody else. However, what you do not know is that in spite of all of the New Year's resolutions and stuff that you would have uh, endeavored to make, you are still programmed spiritually for failure or whatever. That hasn't yet to be broken. That has yet to be dealt with. So the reality is, the grim reality is, more than likely you're going to repeat, if not get worse than what you did last year or what you experienced last year. So that particular teaching tomorrow morning is going to be dealing strictly with how do we break those ties, break those covenants, break those spiritual orders and ordinance that has held us and has programmed us to be repetitive in the failures of our lives, bringing in another year, making it even worse. So that's what we're going to deal with tomorrow. The second thing I want to talk about tonight, just briefly, before I get into this teaching, there's another book that I have here for you. I'm going to read it first. The book is called, I, I mentioned this book before, but I, I, I want for those who you know, been joining me recently. This book is called Rewriting Your Family History. And it's uh, written by a Dr. Steve Ogan. Excellent book. Excellent book. I've read the book twice, actually. That's how good it is. It's a, it's a small read. It's not a thick book. It's very, very good. Very, very informative. It speaks a lot about generational stuff. You know, this, this is a teaching that we really, really... We really need to get into because so much of what you're going through now, so much of who you are, has so much to do with your past. And if you have little knowledge about your past, then more than likely you will repeat the failures and downfalls of your ancestors. That same cycle will come upon you now. And what you don't know is that there are evil spirits, demonic forces, assigned to your life, by extension your family, that are responsible for ensuring that you repeat the same failure, the same having children out of wedlock, the same divorce like your mommy, daddy, and so on, the same uh, uh, premature death. No, those things aren't by accidents, you know? And, and, and my thing is 2017 is about educating yourself about those things so that you do not become a victim of those who are ignorant to these things. So, so the book here, I don't think you could see it that well, and it's... it's I don't know why, but whenever I put this in the camera, I always give it in the reverse. But the book is called Rewriting Your Family History by Steve, S-T-E-V-E-O-G-A-N. Very, very, very good book. I think they have it on Kindle, on Amazon. You can order it at Amazon. I got the hard copy. I normally get it on my Kindle. But sometimes I like to keep a few more books. And the only reason why uh, I get them on my Kindle is because my wife tells me I have too much books in this house. <laughs> But nevertheless, so let's get into this. <clears throat> Tonight, our teaching is about the spiritual implications of eating in a dream. Now, prior to us getting into that, there's some things that I have to go over as it relates to certain laws 
of the Bible and certain laws of that Bible that governs, again, this world that we live in, the physical world, but more importantly, the world that we cannot see. All of my teachings are based on that. Whatever I teach, the basis of that teaching deals with the unseen world because that's what it's all about. There can be no none of this, what you see right now, or even what's existing where you are, if there was not an unseen world. Because the unseen world, what we refer to as the spirit world, is the origin of all things. If you are a Christian and you have yet to log down that concept, then I don't have to be a prophet to prophesy to you that you have a lot of issues in your life. And the Christian walk, as you were told it was, isn't panning out the way that it should be. But the only reason for that it isn't that Christ is less powerful or Christ is a lie or his word is a lie. You have yet to be taught the understanding of whom you really serve, of, of what you really worship, what factors are involved that is governing this Christianity, this, this God, this Jesus, this devil. You know, all throughout life, we hear about these things and people say, you know, go get saved. You know, the Lord's soul come and basically frighten you into it. And you should get saved. I'm not discounting that. But no one has really sat us down, sat us down and really break this thing down to us so that we would have an understanding of the basic. What is the basic here? What is the spiritual basic? And knowing that spiritual basic, getting that firm foundation of the spiritual realm, then everything else becomes easy because everything else is built on that. Now, I just want you to go to me with me in Numbers chapter 21. <clears throat> and I just want to show you something. And this has a lot to do with what we're talking about now, the, the spirit world, right? And I just want to put, put a pin in this point right here. And then we're going to go into our main course. <clears throat> in Numbers chapter 21, the story is told about two kings. And these two kings, Israel, of course, they was on their way to the promised land. Israel had inquired both of them to take a shorter cut through their countries, which would have been a much more easier walk or way to travel rather than taking the original route to the promised land, which would have been much, much longer. <clears throat> both kings rejected their requests. The first king was uh, Zion of the Amorites. Israel sent a messenger to, to ask to pass through their country. Not only did they tell them no, but Zion and his, his entourage came to fight Israel. The Lord gave Israel permission and Israel destroyed them. But I want to take your attention and I hope you have your Bible. I always tell you, get a Bible, get a pen whenever I come on. You're in class. You're in class. Get a pen because I like to give you scripture on everything that I say. In Numbers chapter 21, and when we read from verse 32, you're going to read something here that literally explains the basis of my teachings as it relates to the spirit world. Now, in the text that I'm about to read here, it's speaking about this king by the name of Og, O-G. And he was the king of Bashan. So we're going to read, we're going to pick up this story from Numbers 21, and we're going to read from verse 32. And here's what it says. It says, And Moses sent to spy out Jezer, and they took the villages thereof and drove out the Amorites that were there. Now this is what they did to the first king, which was Zion. So Israel defeated them. So in verse 33 of Numbers 21, it's now going to speak about the second king. So it says, and they, which is Israel, Moses and the Israelites, and they turned and went up by the way of Bashan. And Og, the king of Bashan, went out against them. So this king now, Og, he's the king of Bashan, this particular city. And he's coming now to fight Israel. All right? Nobody provoked this brother. He coming to take Israel down. Now, let me put a pin in here. This guy, which is Og of Bashan, and the former king, which is Sion of the Amorites, at that time, these were like the world's superpowers. Okay? Verse 33 says, And they turned, which is Israel, and went up by the way of Bashan, and Og, the king of Bashan, went out against them, when they came to fight Israel. He, 
which is Beish, which is Og, sorry, yes, Og, Beishan, he and all his people to the battle at Edrei. Now listen to verse 34. All right? Now remember, we're trying to nail down a point here. And the point that we're trying to nail down is showing you the, the mirroring of the things from the spiritual world, meaning that it happens there first before it happens in this world here. All right? Verse 34 of Numbers chapter 21. And the Lord said unto Moses, Now remember, this is the scene. Moses and the children of Israel just finished kicking up Zion, the king of the Amorites, beat them silly, plus took the land. Now they're continuing their journey, but they came across another city, which was Bashan. And the king of Bashan was Og, O-G. Og was in running no tape with them. He decides to come up with his crew to go fight them. So the Lord is about to say something to Moses as it relates to this brother Og, which was the king of Bashan. Verse 34 of Numbers 21. And the Lord said unto Moses, Fear not, for I, which is God, have, I hope you're reading this, I hope you're looking in your Bible, okay? Because I want you to circle the next word. For I, God, have delivered ED. Circle that word. I'm going to circle it in my Bible right now, and I want you to circle your word. Okay, circle that word in Numbers chapter 21, verse 24. I'm read it again. And the Lord said unto Moses, Fear him not. Moses, do not fear the king of Bashan, which is Og, and don't fear his couple million troops coming behind you and little three million Israel. I know it looks intimidating. I know it can become very scary, but, but don't fear. But watch what he says. God says, don't fear because I have delivered him, which is Og, into thy hand. Now let's 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 stick a pin in there. Let's stick a pin there. I've read in the previous verse that Moses and his crew had defeated Zion, the king of the Amorites. And continuing their journey to the promised land, they came across a city by the name of uh, Bashan, whose king was Og. Og didn't wait for them to attack, which they weren't. They wouldn't ask permission to go. So Og uh, decided to do a, 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 a defensive attack, offensive attack against them. But God says to Moses, he says, I have already delivered. Now, that, I'm confused here because to, to deliver, to, to deliver, delivered, ED, means that you're speaking of an event that has already happened. However, Moses and his crew is just approaching Bashan. They have yet to throw the first stone, the first spear, or done or had any kind of discourse with the group in Bashan. But God is saying, listen, Moses, I have already delivered them unto you. The reason why I'm bringing up this point as the basis of what I'm about to go into next is to give you a clear example, and there's so much more scriptures like this, where God, the spirit realm, is where everything, nothing happens here. Nothing happens in this physical world unless that is done or conceived or manufactured in the unseen world. That's the bottom line. If, if, if you don't have the basic concept of the dream, of dreaming, of interpreting dreams, this is what it's all about. Your dream is showing you what is already manufactured, what is already conceived, and it's pending to come here. But the only way it can manifest or unfold in this natural realm is through covenants. And that's where the spirit would come in the dream, disguise as different stuff, only to retain the agreement, be it subtly, be it covertly, be it overtly, of the dreamer. Once a spirit and a human being comes in agreement, no matter how that agreement happens, then the manifestation of whatever the will of that spirit is will now run its course legally in this human's life. That is called the law of manifestation. So in this scripture we just read, 
It is telling God says, listen, in the realm of the spirit, I have already defeated Israel. You guys have already defeated them. All you're going to do now is come in agreement with my word by now going to physically receive of what has already been done in the realm of the spirit. And that's what it's all about. That is what your Christian faith is all about. That is what your Christian walk is all about. This is what they should be preaching more of to you in your church. The more you understand the spiritual realm, nobody could bamboozle you but sold money to them to get something in exchange. The more you know about the spiritual realm and you understand it, you will attack cancer with the word of God and reminding God and thanking him for what he has already done for you, healing. And now you come in an agreement with his word, spirit again, you the human, manifestation time. So when you understand that concept, in all of my teachings, you will always hear me pre preach that over and over. You probably can get tired of it, and I don't care, because you need to have an understanding. The understanding is, whatever is pending in the realm of the spirit, be it by the kingdom of light, or be it by the kingdom of darkness, they cannot automatically manifest it in the world. That's not the way the, the law is set up. The way that it is set up is that human cooperation and agreement is a necessity. It's a must in order for what has been conceived in the unseen world to be manifested in this world. So when you hear the word, let me, let me give it to you another way. When you hear the word, the term miracle, when you hear the word breakthrough, this isn't necessarily something that just whoop, whoop, happened out of the blue. No, no. There's an agreement. There's whoever's receiving that miracle or that breakthrough. Someone got a hold of the word of God and begin to believe it and begin to repeat it and begin to love on it and just speak it and repeat it. God, I believe what your word says. And they begin to repeat that particular scripture. What are they doing? They are grabbing a hold and coming in agreement with God's covenant. What is his covenant? His word. So when God said to Moses, he says, listen Moses, don't worry, don't worry about these guys. They outnumber you guys like 10 to 1, but don't worry about that. Because spiritually, I've already addressed this. I've already disabled them spiritually. So when you go into Bashan now, really you just go in there to collect of what I've already ordained for you to have from the realm of the spirit. And Moses, you and Israel will get the victory because if you go and do what I say, if you now go and fight because I've already delivered them and you believe that, that means you came in agreement with my word. And no matter what go down in Bashan, I can promise you, Mr. Moses, that you and Israel are going to come out victorious. Forget it. You got this. So I just wanted to jump on that. For a second because now we'll be going that's just a foundation that's just a foundation now we're going to go to proverbs chapter 23 and again tonight we're talking about the spiritual implications of eating in a dream a lot of you a lot of you have been having these dreams and particularly i've met about the past four days now i've met honestly at least a minimum of 20 people face to face that is who uh, begin to tell me about these crazy dreams they've been having between the month of December and coming into January. And again, I'm not surprised at all. I, I mean, I basically could tell them what they, what, what, they, what, what they probably even dream. Because during this time of the year, coming into the new year, or in the new year, that's between December and January, it is highly likely that you will have some of the most craziest dreams at this point but really they're not crazy what is happening and I, I, I those of you that read my stuff you would read a lot of this I speak about covenant a lot covenant is key here because covenant is that is the word that is the thing that causes that is the vehicle that causes things from the spirit world to manifest in this world what are you coming in agreement with in your dreams what are you uh, covenanting with in your dreams because whatever it is, whatever you come in with, the idea of it from a spiritual perspective is to bring physical manifestation in your life. All right? So if you're having sex in your dreams, especially you men, all right, 
you, you, you're looking for serious problems. Because whomever you are having, even if it is your wife, even if it is your wife, it is a familiar spirit disguised as your wife. And the spirit itself could be a spirit of infirmity, which is sickness, a spirit of poverty, a spirit of insanity, a spirit of delay. It could be any spirit, but you can know what kind of spirit it is when it begins to manifest itself after the dream. If you don't cancel the dream or pray against it or fast against it. Mark that day when you had the dream, when you were so excited about having sex with that poison. Now watch the outcome in your physical life. Watch the delays in that check that was promised you that you're supposed to get a certain day and it, it, you haven't all held to get it. Watch the insurance money you're supposed to get from the hurricane. They're giving you the run around. Now go back to the dreams that you had and now you can begin to identify the spirit that you came in covenant or agreement with that is now manufacturing or producing these things in your life. It's running its course in your life. So Proverbs chapter 23, I want us to look at. And again, we're talking about eating in our dreams, right? And we're going to look at a law here. And we're going to read from verse 1 of Proverbs chapter 23. Here, listen to what it says. It says, When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee. Verse 2 of Proverbs 23. He says, And put a knife to thy throat, to, to thy throat, if thou be a man given to abuse a greedy man, don't eat it. He said, put a, put a knife right here to stop yourself from consuming it or swallowing it. Now, why is he saying that? And how is this relative to eating the spiritual implications of a dream? Well, let's drop down to verse 6. Well, let's finish verse 3. He said, be thou, be not sorry, desirous, Okay, of his dainties or his delicious foods. Listen why he says this. For they, what he's talking about, what is the day? The food. For they are what? Deceitful. What does the word deceit mean? Deceit or to deceive. It means to, to, to put up a show to give an impression of something that doesn't really exist. There's an, uh, there's, a, there's an underlying situation going on here. There's a backdrop of something that is against you. But all of the nice props are being put up to lure you into it as if it's something good. So the scripture here in Proverbs 23 and verse 3, it says, Be not desirous of these foods that you see. He said, For they are deceitful food. Now, let's go back to a dream. I had a lady one time came to me and she was telling me about these series of dreams that she had. And all of them basically had the same contents in that she's always being fed in the dream, but she could never ever see the person that's feeding her. And not only that, when she's being fed, she's always sitting down and there's a group of people around her, but there's this one particular person just feeding her face and just pushing the food in her mouth. And it's like she has no power. She's just consuming this food. So while she's telling me this, I said, that is truly, that is not a good dream. I said, food in a dream represents wickedness, witchcraft really. And what appear to be food is really spirits transform or disguise as food. But the food itself for the most part of those dreams the spirits of infirmity. So I said to her, I said, tell me something. Since you've been having this dream, can you associate any health issues that you had since you've been having the dream? And she didn't even realize it. She said, now that you said that, that it's for real. Since I've had, I've never had the stomach problem prior to having these dreams. What was happening to her, her stomach used to inflate for no reason really, really big, and then it would go down. It then began to become progressively worse, where she would literally feel things moving in her stomach. She went to the doctors. They thought it was liver cancer. They, they tried, they tested, they did everything. They came back with nothing. But she never, ever associated it with the dream. So I said to her, I said, let me tell you something, yeah? Now, you don't have to believe what I'm saying to you, but I'm telling you, based on my knowledge in these areas. Whomever the person was feeding you, 
in the dream. It's clearly someone that's working against you, but they're not working by themselves. You saw the other people around you in the dream. So this is a group effort in your demise. Now here is where it gets interesting. The person that's fighting you, because you don't see their faces in the dream, it tells you, one, these are people that you know, but they're hiding their identity in the dream. Number two, because they're multiple people, it's a group effort. They mean there's a team against you, but there's one leader, and this leader is the controller of this group right here. What they're giving you, which is spiritual demonic concoctions, that is literally feeding your spirit, not your physical mind. That is your, remember, you are asleep on your bed. You are asleep on the floor on the couch. So the physical you are not participating in these events. The physical you is asleep. Your spirit man, which never sleeps, is now moving about, doing whatever in the realm of the spirit. So, but the spirits though, they're not going to, sorry, the people who are fighting you are not coming after you physically. See, and this is what the, 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 the system of witchcraft is all about. The system of witchcraft is, it, it, I hate you, and I really would like to shoot you or stab you and kill you, but there are laws of the land that if I'm found, I could serve a prison sentence or they could hang me. What witchcraft allows me to do is to fight you in the spirit, and I'm going to always be a winner because of your ignorance to this. See, you let others convince you that these things aren't real and this is a bunch of garbage. You know me listening to that fellow all the time and people talking about, oh, yeah, those things don't work no more. And preachers like to tell their members that, keep them stupid, right? And that time the members dying, coughing up black stuff, pains all over their stuff, their body swelling, their hands swelling, their legs swelling. And the preacher screaming, screaming, Jesus, deliver her, Lord, and Jesus Christ, break this. And nothing happening. Why? Because there's a covenant involved. Am I saying that the covenant is greater than the power of God? Never. But God, you read his word, he respects covenants. Ask the children of Israel when they go and mess around with the Gibeonites, when they made a covenant with them. And even though God told them Gibeonites was part of the land of Canaan, and God said to destroy all of them, but they foolishly made a covenant with the Gibeonites unknowingly. Then the Gibeonites lied to them. But God honored the covenant and the very people who he told Israel to kill. And, and uh, I think it was King Saul who had killed some of them. And as a result of it, it caused a famine on the land. And the only way it could have been broken was that the Gibeonites who got the power now because of the covenant said, come on now, we got to kill some more David's or Saul's children in order for us to make amends here. And God honored it. I'm saying that to you because when you hear somebody have witchcraft on them from eating in the dream or whatever and you brush it off it, you're ignorant you're ignorant and if a pastor or preacher or bishop or his grace or his mace or whatever say to you oh don't believe in those things then that believer have a spirit on them of ignorance it's as simple as that because this bible is from page to page if you understand spiritual things is speaking to these things consistently but your leader who is spiritually blind, because he don't see a physical demon, because he don't see a physical, he talks about a devil. He would say, the devil costs your car to get mash. He, he would say those things, but the reality of it, if you come to him and say, boy, pastor, I, I, I believe some spirits on me, or oh, spirits on you, man, it's a child of God. But I'm here to tell you and to break this word down to you. And as you can see, everything that I give you, I'm not making this stuff up. This is right here in your Bible. Right in your Bible. So now, these spirits, through the principles and the rules and the laws and the protocols of the realm of the spirit that the average believer is ignorant to, those spirits, the, the voodoo man, the obe man, takes full advantage of the ignorance of the Christian. And that's why they line it up every weekend, be in possession down there to the graveyard at a young age. Oh, why sister Mary, man, sister Mary had that pain aside for years. Oh, I hear she walk on something. Oh, I hear they fix her. Oh, I hear they do this. Yeah, that's what they do. Well, what you do, Mr. Believer? What, how come you couldn't save Mary? No, you couldn't save her because your people tell you those things aren't real, right? And you buy into that. But let's look at another scripture. Keep your finger because we're coming right back here. Let's go. Let's go here to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 
All right? First Corinthians chapter 2. And let's go straight to verse 14. And from 14, 14 and go back to verse 12. Because I'm going to show you something. First Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. Listen to what it says. But the natural man. Now, who's the natural man? He isn't just us who are physical. In this scripture, it talks about the man who is depleted of spiritual understanding. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit. Mm -mm. If he, don't tell him, the, now he will talk about the Holy Ghost. Or he gotta, he loves to talk about Holy Ghost. And Holy Ghost to him, let me tell you what his definition of Holy Ghost is. Holy Ghost to him is running around the church like a fool and, and throwing yourself all over the place and acting stupid. That's the Holy Ghost. So when church over, they're programmed to say, my God, Sister Mary had an anointing on her tonight. My God, you see how she carried on tonight? She didn't preach. She didn't deliver. She didn't set nobody free. She still broke. She still sick. Her children still lock up. Her boy still on drugs. But she was slain under the spirit. That's the natural man. See, the natural man believe in theatrics. The, the natural man believe in pomp and pageantry. The natural man believe in giving a performance. But there's no power in him. So this scripture here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14, it says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. You hear that? Watch what he says next. For they, watch this now, are foolishness unto him. So when you tell him about witchcraft, oh, come on, man. Like, come on, stop talking that foolishness. Jesus Christ died. He became a curse for you. My God, what's wrong with you? See, he is sick. But that ain't the sick part. He is a sick leader leading you. And what's going to happen? The quality of your life, even though you are a Christian, even though you are a child of God, will be worse than the sinner man. Because that leader who cannot receive the things of God got you tied up just like him. He don't believe it. And so you don't believe it. So you know that also tell me? He is your idol. Because your first commitment and loyalty should be to the word of God. And the day he's going contrary to that is the day you pick up your stuff and get out of there. I know you don't want to hear that. But that's your problem. So it says in verse 14 of First Corinthians chapter 2, But the natural man receiveth, the natural man, the man who don't have the Spirit of God in him is the natural man. The man who resists, who reject the Word of God. The scripture says in the book of Proverbs, I can't remember what chapter and verse, but it says that he who rejects the Word of God, even his prayer shall become abomination unto the Lord. But the natural man, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. He cannot. God want to impart this word I'm giving you right now. God, the, the revelations that I'm giving you about the spiritual realm, I'm not making them up. I'm showing you the scriptures. The Bible says the one who rejects this, the one who the, the puts this aside, it says this is that natural fellow, and he is incapable of receiving the things of the Spirit of God. But it didn't end there. It says, for they are foolishness to him. Mm -hmm. They are foolishness unto him. Listen to what it says that. Neither can he know them. No matter how much you try to explain to him, he's going to stick and say, listen, buddy, Christ died for us. All right? And Christ became a curse for us. And the day you became a Christian, the curse was off your life. Glory be to God. That's what he's going to tell you. You still broke. Cancer still eating up your liver. You still unemployed even though you have 66 trillion degrees. But he's telling you the curse is off you. Mm -hmm. He's telling you the curse is off of you. Right? All your children are drugs. All of your daughters have children of wedlock for different men. None of them are married. And he's telling you the curse is off of you. You have no monies. 
You have to depend on your children to bring money. You have to mind their children so they could give you a couple of dollars because you have so much sickness, Christian woman, for 900 years. But the pastor is telling you there's no curse on your life. But the scripture says, listen to the scripture. It says the natural man cannot receive the things of the spirit of the living God. Why? Because they are foolishness to him. It is stupid for you to think that witchcraft exists even though the Bible speaks about. Even though Micah 5 and 12 said God said he can cut off witchcraft. Even though when we look at uh, Numbers chapter 22 when uh, Balak summons, uh, Balaam summons Balak to come and wake Obia on the children of Israel and he set up these demonic altars and he couldn't curse them because God says, he says, whomever God has blessed, no man can curse. Even though these scriptures are laying out what I've been teaching you about the spiritual realm, his, his majesty, whoever they call themselves, say, oh no, don't listen to that guy. That guy doesn't know what he's talking about. You are the blessed of the Lord. Right. But you're broke. You're sick. You're frustrated, you're tired, and your life is 10 times worse than when you was a sinner. But you're blessed according to him. But what I'm showing you is the things that has limited your life, even though you're a Christian. And my job is to release the revelation to you. You go and do it. I get testimonies every day through my email where people say, I followed what you pointed us to in the word of God. And I'm now seeing the changes in my life. I've been saved for 13 years. One person I've been saved for, for 25 years. And never knew none of this, what I was telling them. And as they begin to decree the word of God and to attack those specific spirits that we identify through these teachings, now the husband getting his act together. Now those children lining up. Now that spirit of rebellion is gone. Now the stomach is now going down and after the three day dry fast with all of the, the scriptures on healing that they were speaking in their prayers while they were fasting those three days, now the cancer gone. The diabetes levels, all of those things now begin to fade away. Why? Was it because of Kevin? No. It was because you believe the word of God. You accepted it. And now you begin to see the manifestation of his word. But let's finish this. He said, the natural man, verse 14 of 1 Corinthians 2, it says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. Why? Why can't he figure them out? Because they are spiritually discerned. So when you talk about witchcraft to somebody, and they say to you, Kevin, I don't believe that Mary, those things are real. Come on, man, let's be real. Well, the Bible just tell you what they're all about. A, they are natural. They are not spiritual. They go based on what they see. So they are already fooled. So you stop talking to them. In fact, you should stop hanging with them. They, they, the, the most they could do for you is keep you backwards in life. The scripture says because the, they do not know the spiritual implication of the things that are around them. All they see is a, a refrigerator, a TV, a house, a car, not a person. And even though they've been saved, even though they've been saved for, for 66 trillion years, they still fight in the pastor. The two sisters in the, in the church still fighting to be a uh, praise and worship leader. Because they're natural. They, they're not looking at the spirit. <laughs> they cannot understand the things of the spirit when you understand the things of the spirit you back off because Mary who was bossy used to carry on and want to run everything in the choir you know what the spiritual man see he sees a spirit of control he sees a Jezebel spirit you know how the spiritual man deal with that never take don't fight Mary at all whenever they see Mary they show Mary love in spite of how no good mean or controlling Mary is but when the spiritual man get home, the spiritual man get on his or her knees and deal with that controlling Jezebel spirit that's ruling Mary. That's what the spiritual man does. The natural man will fight. The natural man will cuss. The natural man will go spread rumors and stuff. See, he's natural and he cannot receive of the things of the Lord. The Lord is downloading the spirits involved for him to now go and fight on his knees. 
But the natural man is ace for, for violating Ephesians 6 and 12. Ephesians 6 and 12 says we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But the natural man is chief in this. He said, man, to hell with all of that. I can't go deal with Mary. But the spiritual man, when Mary come in, the spiritual man sitting right there and say, I bind this devil in the name of Jesus. I come against this controlling spirit. Father, I subdue the spirit. That's what the natural man, the, the spiritual man does. So the scripture says, the natural man can have received these things because they are spiritually discerned. Verse 15 says, but he, listen to this carefully now, but he that is spiritual, watch this, he that is spiritual, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. He that is spiritual judges, not some things, all things. Why? Because he understands that the spirit world is the origin of all things. And when he makes his assessment, it's being based from its origin. So why are you looking at Mary and say, boy, Mary got nasty, bad ways, all about trying to rule people's life. The, the spiritual man says, you know what? Your friend Mary have a controlling spirit. He's able to make that assessment because he's looking at the behavioral patterns that is common with this, when the spirit is on this person. So now they attack the spirit, not Mary. Mary herself was a victim of the spirit. So the spiritual man deal with the spirit. Just had a little base again. Now let's go back to our scripture here. And Proverbs. So Proverbs, again, we're talking about, I know I'm getting a lot of stuff in there, but I just got to pack this so you can understand it. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 1 to 3 says to us, "If the, don't eat no food, period, from these people. It says, when thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before you. Look at this good in the realm of the spirit. Is this really this nice uh, uh, collard greens that I really, really love? How come every time you have these dreams, it is always stuff that you love? But the scripture says in verse 3, it says, Be not desirous of his dainties or delicious meat or food, for they are deceitful meat. Let's drop down to verse 6. Verse 6 says, Eat thou not the bread of him that have an evil eye. I had a friend one time told me that she had this friend, not friend, but but they used to be friends, best friends too. And some riff happened between them. I mean, they were, they hated each other with a passion. And one night she had a dream. And in this dream, her friend was feeding up. Listen, when she told me the dream, I said, listen, you have a Bible anywhere near you right now. I, I, I can let the Bible interpret this dream for you. So she had one right down in her glove compartment in the car where she was at. So I said, now get your Bible and turn your Bible to Proverbs chapter 23 and read verse 6 for me and read it out loud so me and you could hear it. And she said, reads, eat thou not the bread of him that have an evil eye, neither be desirous thou of his meat. You know you and this person will get along in the natural. So why are you eating from them in your dream or in the spiritual realm? You think what they're feeding you is good? No. If you know anything about spiritual warfare, you will also know that people through the powers or the system of witchcraft that astral project in your dream and do things to you that you will never allow under normal circumstances. It is what happened after the agreement, the contact has been made, whether they kiss you, hug you, had sex with you. All of these things represent agreement, feeding you. That is not good. That is not good. It is witchcraft concoctions. Sometimes ministered by those who project, but more than likely by our familiar spirits. And the whole idea of is to change your original. To change your original means that they're going to now alter what God has originally created for you to do, to do and to be. If you were called to be a preacher, teacher, whatever, whatever you eat those things in the dream, it's just, remember, it's your spirit they're feeding. It is literally binding your spirit and taking you off course where God originally wanted you to go. This is why the scripture says, stay away from people with familiar spirits or familiar spirits and all. Have nothing to do with them. Why? Because they will corrupt you. Okay, you, you don't believe me. Turn, let's go. Keep your finger here because we're coming right back here to share another point. 
go to Leviticus chapter 19 and look at verse 31. All right? And let's hear what the scripture says because you, you might have a problem believing me. And the truth is, I, I like when you don't believe me so I can prove it through the word of God. <laughs> Leviticus chapter 19, and we're going to read verse 31. And here's what it says. Regard not them that have familiar spirits. When your dead parents or dead relatives showing up in your dream, that is a familiar spirit. If you're having sex with your wife or your husband in your dream, and I know you're saying, Kevin, that was my wife. Kevin, that was, I'm telling you that was her. I am telling you, it was not your wife, okay? Because your wife is on the bed sleeping, just like you. So who was that in your dream? It is a familiar spirit disguising itself as your wife to seal a covenant with you to change your original, to defile you. The word defile means to corrupt. The, the word corrupt means to change something from its original. So in, in Leviticus chapter 19 verse 31 says, Regard not them that have familiar spirits. We didn't know be a man them dealing with familiar spirits. You didn't show up in your dream. Familiar spirits. Regard. Don't pay no attention. That means it's neither seek after who? Wizards. These are witches and obey people. Witchcraft people. Stop going to them. He can tell you why. He says, seek not after wizards to be defiled by them. And I told you the word defiled means to corrupt something. It means to change its original. It's like having a glass of pure white milk and you drop red paint in it. You've changed the original of the entire thing. So when these things show up in your dream, and if you're being fed in your dream, I know of two people right now who I have interceded and prayed with and encouraged them, and I went on a fast with them, who are suffering from stomach cancer all as a result of eating in their dreams. And all of this stuff, and overnight, overnight this just rushed up, boop, 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 diagnosed with cancer. Well, first of all, it took a while before I was diagnosed. They had to do like a million tests. And so it's almost as if they say, you know what, it's cancer. And I said to them, get all of the scriptures about healing in the Bible. Write them down. And you put aside a day to do a three-day, check with your doctor first, a three-day three dry fast. I've done it many times. I've recommended it many times. The results are phenomenal. A three-day dry fast is a fast for three days. No food, no water. And you saturate yourself with scripture. If you could get the three days off from work and get to a place and just, you pray. You might say, but Kevin, I can't pray that long. Don't matter. Get the scriptures. Repeat the scriptures on healing. Because of his stripes, I'm healed. He sent his word to heal me. Father, I take your word and I speak to the spirit that's in my body, that's wasting me away, that's trying to change my original, that's trying to shorten my years. And you speak the word to that during those three days. And you can call me. You can tell me, Kevin, exactly what you said. What's going to happen? Happened to me. Why? Because you're not natural anymore. You ain't just settling for the diagnosis of cancer. You are spiritual. And the spiritual man judges all things. Why? Because he's judging from the origin, the spiritual realm. If they're not teaching you this in your church, then your quality of life ain't good. I can tell you that right now. I don't have to be there. I don't have to see you. So back to eating in the dream. It's the most evil dream ever. Any dream where you are eating, if you are at a banquet and you're eating especially raw meat, oh, you better go on a fast immediately because at that point, you're not dealing with your average demonic forces. You're dealing, like Jesus said in Matthew, I think 17 and 20, when he says that, that this kind will only come out through prayer and fasting. So you need to, 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 as soon as you come out of that dream, get on your knees and pray. And if you ate it and you swallowed it, now if you, if you vomited or regurgitated in the dream, that's good. That's good. But still get and pray. Any residue, Father God, in my spirit, get out. Now if you ate it and you come out of the dream, get on your knees. Father God, in the realm of the spirit, I'm asking you to make my spirit, not your physical mind, make my spirit vomit whatever they had placed in whatever food they gave me to eat. Father, I renounce this. Whatever agreement I came, in, came into unknowingly, 
in that dream by consuming what was given to me, I come against it. All witchcraft powers that is now in me to reprogram my destiny, I curse you in the name of Jesus Christ. I send the fire of God to the root to unseat you out of my spirit, man. I reject you. Now you bring in the law, which is the scripture. For my body in the name of Jesus Christ is the temple of the Lord. And only that which is of God shall dwell in here. Anything else is foreign and I evict you out of my spirit in the name of Jesus. That's how you pray. That is how you pray. You have to speak it. Speak the word of God to the demonic forces that's been projected at you. Now, let me give you this tip. One of the signs... That you're gonna, that you're gonna see physically, to know that you're gaining victory in the spiritual realm. And this can blow your mind. This can blow your mind. When you start to, to declare warfare prayers, and here's what I mean by warfare prayers: you take in scriptures relative to your situation, and declaring it in the spiritual realm to the specific spirits you've identified as the root of your problem. That is what you call raw warfare prayers. For example, let's say you're dealing with a spirit of poverty. You can't save no money, you never have enough, you're always borrowing. So you grab scriptures where Christ, God has promised you. Uh, for example, let's say Ephesians 3 and 21, I think it is, where it says, God says, I will do abundantly and above all that you could ever ask or think according to the power or the word that worketh in you. So you take that scripture, Father God, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, I speak to the altars of poverty that's projected at me. I repent of my ancestors and even myself that have not fulfilled my financial obligations as it relates to you. Now, I know what you're thinking right now, you know. Oh, I ain't paying my tithe. I'm talking about that. I'm also talking about there are many times God asks you to sow into somebody else's life. Someone, the spirit was heavy on you to invest this in someone's life. But you never did it. Not knowing now that's bringing a curse on you. Why? Because you, you, you literally rejecting the word of God. Remember what the Bible says in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse, beginning at verse 1. If you hearken and listen and do diligently all my laws and commands, then shall you be blessed in your body, blessed in the field, blessed, blah, blah, blah. Drop down to verse 15 of Deuteronomy 28. But if you do not hearken and listen unto the voice of the Lord thy God and do all his commandments, then shall you be cursed. I'll take it a step further. The scripture says, and this is a powerful scripture, uh, Psalm chapter 41 Verses 1 to 3. Listen what it says. It says, Blessed is he that considers the poor. Watch this now. Now, blessed is, quote unquote, he. He didn't say blessed is the Christian. He didn't say blessed is the Pope. The word he is generic for anyone who participates in this law. He says, blessed is he that considers the poor, for the Lord will help him in his time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive and not turn him over to the will of his enemies. What does that mean? Every time the Lord moves on you to invest in the sun, and I don't like to use the word so because people always affiliate that with money. When I use the word so, it could be anything the Lord is telling you to release at that time. That scripture says to you that you are securing in the future, not if, but when trouble come, you could declare the scripture and remind God. Now, God, remember what your word says. You said, blessed is he to consider the poor. You move on me to bless Brother Joe. You move on me to do this to Mary. I had the last set of money in my hand to go pay this bill, but I obeyed you. Lord, I got this court case coming up. Lord, I got this situation on the job. You can now go to Proverbs 41 and what do you say? Remind me of my word. And you could say, Lord... This, this is what you said to me. I in this situation. I don't have enough funds to take care of this. I don't have nothing. But I'm asking you right now. According to your law. You say if I take care of the poor. That you will preserve me. And not turn me over to the will of my enemies. I've seen it happen in my life personally. I've seen it happen in other people's life. These are the laws of God. That they don't teach you in church. These are the laws of God. That are responsible for improving. And making better the quality of your life. 
the quality of your life is not better, even though you've been saved 10, 5, 15, 16 years. You're still doing that same thing in church over and over by thinking you could pay for a breakthrough and pray for a miracle. No. Do the laws of God, practice them, institute them into your life, and then watch the manifestation of these laws. It's as simple as that. The Bible says also, I think it's in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, and verse either 24 or 26, I'm not sure, but I know it's coming down towards the last verse. And it says that the Lord gave it to a man that is good in his sight, wisdom, knowledge, and joy. But he gave it to the sinner, burden and travail, make him work hard to retain riches. So the Bible says only for God to take that from him and give it to the one who is good unto him. Why am I telling you these scriptures? Because when you pray now, and this is my way of encouraging you to pray the word of God, Take those scriptures and you now begin to speak those words. Father, I should not be a poor Christian. I should not be struggling. I should not be battling this liver disease or cancer or diabetes. But nobody teaches you that. You are literally encouraged to accommodate those things in your life. And how is that? Child, mommy had diabetes. And you know, Peter got it right. And my first cousin. And then how you refer to you? My diabetes. That isn't what Jesus Christ died for. That isn't what he was publicly humiliated for and beaten to a pope. That isn't why he was put a crown of thorns in his head and, and hung to a cross for you to claim something that he did not do for you. The purpose of that cross is to give you a better Aside from your eternal salvation and spending eternity with him, you, are, you can live a good quality of life through the premises of his laws. But nobody is teaching you that. And you get upset with people like me when I bring these things to you. Don't get upset with me. Get upset with them who's not telling you that. Get upset with them who's fleecing your pockets. Get upset with them who live in better houses than you. Those who you worship, every two words, pastor say, pastor say this, pastor. What did God say? What did you read that God say? What did you read that God say that you are implementing in your life to see the manifestation in your life? Just ask it. We need to get to the laws of God. And getting to the laws of God means we begin to speak his word against the spirits that's operating behind that person. The spirits that's operating behind that car. The spirits that's operating behind that toilet with wooden flush. As simple as that. Kevin, you, you running out. No, I'm not running out. The origin of all things are spiritual. And we just read in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He says, for the natural man don't know that. He cannot design the things of God. God trying to feed him every day. Spiritual revelation and information. But he discounted that because what God said to him don't add up physically. So when you say to him, you know you could be healed of that cancer. You know God could deliver you out of that. He, because he don't have no money on his account or no first cousin who's a rich man, then he, he, he cannot envision that. The scripture, and that's what I said to you earlier in my teaching, if you cannot nail down the basic rule of the spiritual realm, that everything happens over there before it happens here, then you will never receive the things of God. You can't. I don't care how much they pray over you. I don't care how much they scream at you. I don't care how much they duck you with olive oil, cooking oil, western oil, whatever other oil. It is not going to do you any good. Because the requirement for that is you must come to the understanding that the laws of God are spiritual. They dictate to the realm of the spirit. They subdue the forces that are against you. Those forces that are against you, they can only work against you. Witchcraft can only work against you. Voodoo, hoodoo, and every other do can only work against you. You have to be a participant of that. You have to work along with them. How is that, Kevin? By being ignorant to the things of God, by rejecting that these things are real, by buying into what some religious fanatic is telling you, that don't mind those things, those things are fictitious, you shouldn't focus on that. You, you should focus on that. You have to. The, the quality of your life will not change if you don't come to this understanding. All right? It's as simple as that. Your life will be the same as it was last year, the year before. In fact, it's going to be worse this year and worse going forward. If you stick to that mentality that if you go to church, everything is going to be all right. See, people say to me all the time, Kevin, how come you don't go to church? Or you only just visit church when you have to teach or you have to do a little conference here or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I say to them, but tell me something. You always go to church every Sunday. Every Bible study, 
every uh, woman thou art loose, every cat thou art loose, every billy goat thou art you there. And I have a better quality of life than you, and I, I rarely go. But what you don't know, I stay in the Word. Read it every day, study it every day, decree it every day, encourage others about it, write about it, do videos about it, do audios about it. Always encouraging someone and getting the Word out of, in them and getting it in me. And look at me and look at you who's going to that same four walls every day. Look at the quality of life and I've got to look at me again. And now you compare the two. So going to a church isn't going to make your life better. Being buddy-buddy with the pastor ain't going to make your life better. Carrying his Bible on the pulpit, being his armor bearer or gun bearer or whatever bearer isn't going to make the quality of your life. The scripture does not say that. The scripture says if you obey my law, if you do what I tell you to do, then shall you be prosperous. Then shall you be blessed. God says in Deuteronomy chapter 28, if you hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God and do all his commandments, then the word then or the word if means it's conditional. It doesn't automatically happen because you say you save. If that was the case, everyone would want to be saved because the minute you get saved, you are debt free, you are sick free, and all these other that doesn't didn't happen, right? It didn't happen because after you got saved, which is you were reinstated with God, he's now saying, Now take the manual to improve your spirit, man, to have a better quality of life by practicing the laws that I have laid here for you. And you don't do that. And more than likely, the only time your Bible is get opened up is when you get to the church. And when it closes, is when pastor and get a large scripture. And the next time the Bible opens again is when you go back Sunday or, or whenever it is. And you love to tell everybody, child, I don't miss church. You hear me? I just be there. Pastor, just meet me there, child. Not a Sunday. If I sick, I come in. If I could go to work, I could come to church too. What does all of that mean if you do not practice the law to give you a better quality of life? What does, in fact, you should be shame and embarrassed. You should be embarrassed to tell me you are Christian for X amount of years and fighting off diabetes. And your house is in disarray. And you're confused and you don't know what is going on. And yet you should be, you should never tell nobody you are Christian. Because if I was a sinner man and I look at your life and that's what being a Christian after 30 years is due to you, well, I wouldn't be a sinner man. Because clearly my life was better. You got to look at it from a realistic, spiritual perspective. This year, 2017, is a year of God and what he's doing right now. Pouring out revelation. He's pouring out knowledge. He's pouring out spiritual insight. Why? Because this is the antidote of destruction. This is how you are not destroyed. The scripture says in Hosea 4 and 6 that my people, not the sinners, not the witchcraft workers, he's talking about the believers. He says, my people are destroyed. Why are they destroyed? They shouldn't be destroyed because they're your people, God. So you should be protecting them, God. What kind of God are you? No, 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 no. My people are destroyed because they are lacking my knowledge. My people are destroyed because they refuse to do what I ask them to do. My people are destroyed because they're doing everything except what I tell them in the Bible. They can have Mike Murdoch and everybody else come them and give them some kind of snake oil or dizzle, dazzle them with nothing leave God's hand unless something leave your hand. Am I that powerful? What do you mean nothing leave God's hand? And every time I hear him talk that mess on TV, I'm like, are people really listening to him? When God created the heavens and the earth and, and, and the garden of Eden, Eden before Adam and Eve got here, well, well, who released something so God could release that? Think about what these clowns are saying. Read your, let your Bible, if you are an avid reader of your Bible, if you are a study of the word of God, when they're talking, red flags will just go up, go up, go up, go up. Turn my TV off. These demons on you are just speaking nonsense. You see, everybody getting intellectual with the word of God and giving their little cliches and philosophies and all this garbage. No, let's go back to the simple word. The Bible say, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. That means he's studying. That shall bring forth his fruit, listen to this now, in his season. Now, did you hear and he shall be by the rivers of water, sowing seed. And that seed that he have sown shall bring forth. And he said, no, you didn't read that. You didn't read that. And you ain't going to read it. 
And what I'm saying to you is you let these people come in here and pollute your mind with nonsense. And you can't blame them in the end. When you stand before God on that great day, you're going to have to give an account. And God is going to say to you, remember the Bible says that many will cry and say, Lord, Lord, haven't we done this and haven't we done that? He says, shut your mouth. He said, I never knew you. You was in love with a man. You was in love with a pastor. You was in love with a human. Is that human who you worship? You never worship me. And you want me to prove to you, my child, that you wasn't worshiping me? Because when that human say him and his wife go on vacation and his children to Disney World for the next two weeks and not going to be here, you never ever came to church. Because your belief, your faith, your hope was in a man. You never open the scriptures and read the word. You never allow that word to penetrate your spirit man. Your spirit man, you've been saved for 10, 15, 5 years. And your spirit man is hungry. It is malnourished. You starved it by not feeding it the word of God. You fed it everything else except the word of God. And my teaching is to break that. My teaching is to force you to go into the scriptures. My teaching is to, to release revelation knowledge where you will say, is that really true? Let me go look. Yes, I got you now. Get back in the book. Yes, it there. Read it. They don't preach it because it can go against their real intent. Read the word of God. Build your spirit. Are you fearful? Are you experiencing depression? Are you going through mental issues? These things are happening because the spirits are taking advantage of your ignorance. I promise you. Commit for the next seven days that you're going to open the word of God every day. And even if you only read one scripture, get it out of the way because that scripture is feeding your spirit. John 3 and 16, Psalms 23, Ezekiel, excuse me. You know what? Grab scriptures that you never even went into before. Forget the common ones. Go into Ezekiel, read a page of Daniel, read uh, something else. Build your spirit man. And I can assure you, uh, for the next seven days, if you commit to reading the word of God, watch the way that you think begin to change. Watch your confidence level begin to, watch how you begin to see, watch how you begin to see sin for what it really is. Without the word of God, like the, the Bible says, you, you are a natural man and you cannot receive what God is trying to say to you. And that's why a lot of people, when they come to me for a dream interpretation and whatever, and I begin to release the revelation that the Holy Spirit gave me, a lot of, well, I say a lot of them, quite a bit of them, well, they say, man, I can't, man, I ain't nobody all that. I'm not upset with them. I'm not mad with them because I go back to the law. And the law says in first, sorry, Corinthians 2 and 14, it says, for the natural man cannot receive of the things of God because the things of God are spiritual. He can't see that. So when you're telling him about familiar spirits and masquerading spirits and, 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 and these things coming to you in your dream, and I had a, a, a lady the other day who almost going to fight me when she was telling me her mom has come to and talked to her all the time in a dream. And I said to her, I said, listen, I, I hate to tell you this, but that is not your mom. And the only thing she didn't fire at me was the F word. So I said, I said, listen, you can get upset all you want. You came to me. I didn't come looking for you. And I'm giving you what you came for. What you're dealing with in your dream is not your mother. And if you've been dealing it with, with it for a number of years, then that explains the quality of your life right now. That spirit that is pretending to be your mother has now gained your trust to the extent that forging covenants in different areas of your life to lock you down is easy. Because you're never resisting the spirit. You're never praying against the spirit. That spirit is oppressing you, coming disguised as your mother. And as a result of that, it is now manifesting its will in your life and has drawn a line in the realm of the spirit. And therefore, you can only go so far in life. You need to pray against those things. Now, I, I, was forget, I forgot my point earlier, but now I remember it. I was doing all that so I can bring it back. <clears throat> One of the evidence of praying the word of God speaking the word of God in your prayer, especially warfare prayers. And I want you to hear me. The physical evidence of that, you're going to see things showing up in your home dead, such as roaches. Uh, for, and you would see like three, four of them, maybe even to your room door. And they'd be turned on their back. You didn't spray no spray, none of that. You may find centipedes in your home. And I've seen it in my own life. I've, I've, I've constantly with other people the same thing. And they came home and met centipedes and stuff on their back. Now, how does that happen? Dead. 
All these were murdering spirits using the, the bodies of these things. Now, I know you're saying, now, Kevin, you, you far off. Well, I can't be far off because if I far off, the Bible far off too. Because the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3 that Satan used the body of the snake. That is what you read, right? In fact, the snake spoke. Hello? Uh, we shoot down to the New Testament when the evil spirits was in the man and the evil spirits begin to negotiate with Jesus. Say, Jesus, don't, don't, don't take us out of this, this, this territory. Send us in the pigs. And the scripture says Jesus somehow agreed with them and cast the evil spirits from out of the man into the pigs. And the pigs went and they drowned themselves down the hill. And the scripture says that over 2,000 of them died. So we had a minimum of 2,000 spirits. Well, it was a legion. A legion is, from what I read in the, the, the dictionary, anywhere from 3,000 to 5,000. So I'm saying to you, before you make your assessments on me, go, don't come to me with no, go, because I can give you scripture for everything that I say. Come to me with your fact. Don't say to me, those stuff ain't real and you have nothing to support why they're not real. The spiritual world is a real world. If you don't understand and lock down the concept of that world, then I am telling you, what, yes, you can go to heaven if you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But you're going to fight for everything you ever get. And when you get it, it can be short-lived simply because you don't understand that there are invisible forces influencing people, places, and things around you to keep you oppressed, to keep you broke, to keep you sick, to make you be filled with depression. That is a demon. A lot of y'all can meet Jesus Christ on the day of judgment and you've never used your talent. God called you to teach. God called you to witness to other people. God called you to do so many things. So many of you are packed with talent. But you just satisfy with just being a Christian. You just satisfy with just showing up to four walls to say, well, you're putting in your time. You're punching your, your, your clock. No, you're going to have to give an account for the gift that you did not use. I see people be getting on my case all the time. They love to handle my name and everything. Who he is? Where he come from? He got a church here and you're talking. This he's a minister. He's a boy. He is. I never hear about him before telling people with this and that. Don't worry about me, you know. Don't worry. Kevin operating in his gift. When Kevin stand before the master and the master come, bring, show me that DVD. Well, let me see what Kevin did all right. Did Kevin write those articles that I told him to? Did Kevin did those videos that I told him to? Did Kevin go to those different places that I had preachers and teachers invite him to to get my word to these people to educate them? Did he? Yes, sir. Kevin did it. Now come here, Mr. Complainer. Uh, did you do so and so? No, you was too busy on Kevin's case. Mm -mm. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 25, I think beginning at verse 19 somewhere, it talks about the, the three guys who master gave them a talent. You know, one with the five, one with two, and the one with one talent. And we, we all know with the two guys who, 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 who had the five and the two talent, they went out there and they invested their talent. They invested it, and when they came back to reconcile with their master, they said, see, master, you gave me five, but all oh, when I went out there and I did my gift of teaching, look how much people I brought back to the kingdom of God. And the master said, you know what, thou good and faithful servant, you have been good over little, I will make you master over much. He said, now go in and enjoy your rest. The same thing he did with the guy with two. Now, here's what I want you to look at, because this is a revelation. And for you, or just sitting on your behind and not doing what God has called you to do, and do it, you're there trying to run behind careers and running down degrees. And I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with that. Make God priority. You can leave that degree here when you die. But your record for what you would have done as far as what God has called you to do, you've got to answer to another side. The guy with the one talent come before his, came before his master. And he said to the master, he says, say, master, you know you just sow where you didn't reap. And I was afraid. Listen to what he said. He was afraid. He was so afraid that he never used his talent. But listen what the master said to him. The master labeled him as a wicked servant. And I said to myself, how could that be? Because when I think of the word wicked, I think of fornicator. I think of witchcraft worker, a sorcerer, a murderer. That's the categories I put wicked in. No, no, no. The scripture says he is wicked because he sat on the talent that God gave him to bring other people into the kingdom of God, to activate the gift of other people, to inspire them. 
but he sat on it. He buried it. He put it in the ground. And the scripture says, he, the, the master called him a wicked and slothful servant. Not only that, guess what he did? The Bible said that the master took the one gift that he had, because he obviously didn't know how to do it, and gave it to the guy who had ten. Why did I add that little piece in there? What the Bible says. Because I hear people say all the time, and this is why, again, why you need to know your Bible. Child, what God got for me, for me. What God got for me, the devil can't take. You're right, the devil can't take. God is going to take it away from you. Why should he leave you with it if you ain't doing nothing with it when the purpose of it was to bring more people into the kingdom? So I don't know who I'm speaking to. You need this year to get moving on what you know God has called you to do. There are many people who have left this earth in 2016 who have not fulfilled their mandate, who even left here not secure in their salvation. They have to stand before God one day. They're going to have to explain to this God who has given them life, why did they? God says, you know what? You couldn't see this on earth, but that gift that I had given you, had you used it, look over here. You would have been for 66, you would have been responsible for 66 million people coming to the kingdom of God. You'd be like, well, God, how could that be? Well, because every time you sow my word and somebody gets saved and they got somebody else, it was almost like a pyramid thing. But all of that never happened because you made the decision to take your gift, dig a hole, and bury it in the ground. Now, I know this teaching wasn't about this, but I felt led to say those things to you. 2017 is a year God has spared your life to get it right one more time. Get it together. Stop being a part of a congregation that is not feeding you. Stop going there because the church is popular or the pastor is popular. Am I saying don't go to church? I will never tell you that. Go to wherever you want to go. But make known to yourself, not to them, that your purpose for being here is to be spiritually fed. The purpose for being here is to make my election sure. The purpose of being here is to come into an understanding of that there are underlying curses in my life. I want to break them from not off of my life only, but I do not want to see my children live their life after I'm gone and living like paupers, living like whores and pimps, all because mommy and daddy, who, who, who was ignorant to the law, was not able to deal with those curses. I don't know who you are. Think about your life. Your life isn't just about you. If you have children, those children are going to pay for the things that you do and even the ones in the past. You now are coming into these teachings to grab a hold of the spiritual implications of curses and break them now and change the course and destiny of your children who are programmed through your ancestors to fail in the future. You, you have the power to do that right now. This is what these teachings, I encourage you all the time, watch my videos. I have them on YouTube, I have them on Facebook, I have a whole blog site with over 500 articles on it. I am in the Freeport News, the Tribune, everywhere. I am trying to get the Word of God out there. Why? Because this is the talent He is giving me to invest in your life, to bring more back to the Kingdom of God. It is simple as that. Father God, I thank you for the people that are watching tonight. Father God, yes, we were supposed to be teaching about eating and the dreaming. We did that, but we add some more to it. I break that spirit of slothfulness off of them. I break that spirit of procrastination. I break that spirit, Father God, of, of claiming they're waiting on you when the truth is the enemy has deceived them. Father God, I pray that you remove the blindness from their eyes and that you, O oh Lord, will catapult them to shock them. Give them a wake-up call. That look here, time is going. And the time that is appointed for them to leave this earth could be tomorrow, could be next week. What is it that they have done as it relates to the things that you've blessed them with to bring more back to the kingdom? Let this message tonight, Father God, resonate in their mind. Cause this message tonight, Father God, to reach to the hearers that even after this video has ended, it will still penetrate ears and eyes to come. I pray for those right now who are, who are still battling as to whether or not they should get saved. Father, I break that spirit off of them that is only delaying them. The spirit is aware of when the time of their demise is coming. And the spirit is doing everything within its power to hinder them. 
till that day of death come. But I rebuke that spirit in the name of Jesus. I sever that spirit from their lives in the name of Jesus. And that their eyes will be open, Father God, and that they will be able to accept you without any form of hindrance, delay, or regret. I pray, Father God, now that they will come or you will lead them into houses that you have called. Men and women that you have called who are not ashamed to teach your word and empower the spirit of your people. Father God, I break the spirit of ignorance. I break the spirit of spiritual ignorance. I come against every person, Father God, that has been bound. I come against the spirit, sorry, that has bound them with the spirit of ignorance. Your word declares, Father God, that if, if our gospel or the word of God be, be, be hid, it is only hid from those who don't believe. And as a result of their unbelief, your word says that the God of this world has blinded their minds. Father God, I come against the spirit of unbelief. I come against the spirit of unbelief of the things of the spirit. I subdue the natural man and call for the spirit man out of them in the name of Jesus. Because it is the one who is spiritual that is able to judge all things according to your word. Father, I come against any kind of fix or hex or voodoo or incantation or seducing spirits. Whatever has incapacitated them spiritually that has caused them not to be able to perform physically. It is that spirit I sever from the leg in the name of Jesus. It is that spirit I send the fire of God against it. I, I, I command to be unseated. Every spirit that is not a part of their life, every familiar spirit, every monitoring spirit, every spirit of sadness and sickness and turn, every spirit that is contrary to the spirit of the living God in their lives, I send the fire of God against it. I rebuke them. I bind them. I command them to be tormented before their time and to be cast into the abyss. Your word declares, Father God, that when an evil spirit leaves a man, it says it, it, it goes into dry places seeking rest. So that tells me that spirits get tired. I command in the name of Jesus that every spirit that has been oppressing you will become tired in the realm of the spirit and leave you by the blood of Jesus Christ and the fire of the living God. I pray right now for the salvation of those who are not saved or are listening to me. Time is running out on you. And I pray by the power of Jesus Christ that you will accept God as your Lord and Savior before you leave from time into eternity. I pray right now for every child of the watchers of this video tonight. I break that spirit of rebellion. I break that spirit of rejection. I break that spirit that has been making them feel insignificant. That is causing them to lead to endless roads of suicide and hate and bitterness and anger. I curse those demonic powers that is trying to enslave them only to shut down their lives at an early age. But I reject it and it will not take place in the realm of the spirit because that is where everything happens. So I break the power of the devil. I break the evil one hand over the lives of those children. Whatever their mother or father or grandparents had done wickedly through the powers of witchcraft that has levied that curse upon them. Father, I revoke it. I break it. Give those children a chance to live and to live a quality of life unto you, Lord. Forgive their parents so that the curse be broken and the covenants will enslave them no more. I release them into 2017 free of those shackles, free of those cords, free of those changes that once held them as a result of the sins of their ancestors. You said in your word, Lord, that the iniquities of our ancestors or forefathers that you guarantee, not the devil, but you would, would visit us up to the third and fourth generation. Father, I repent tonight, not just over my family, but the family of these watchers, the family of these listeners, that whatever has held them down, that they had nothing to do with in the past, I'm asking that the power of your grace, the power of which your son did on the cross, will break the invisible barriers over the lives of these people and set them free in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ. I thank you for watching tonight. I pray that this message was, was edifying to you. Uh, like I said earlier, I will be on the Cindy Russell show tomorrow morning from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. 
It's going to be an excellent show. Those who are here in Freeport or in the Bahamas, 8, 10 a.m. in Tunin, it's going to be a life-changing show. And we're going to be speaking to your destiny, but we're speaking it from your past. We need to deal with the past so that you can be cut free of those shackles and to being slingshot to where God has originally uh, called you to be. I encourage you, go on YouTube. I have all of these videos. This video, as soon as I finish this up, I'm going to post it to YouTube. And I told you Zeta, my friend Zeta was very instrumental in getting me to, to, to post these things to YouTube. I love her. She's an inspiration. She's a godsend. She's filled with ideas. I don't got to put on my payroll. <laughs> but she's been excellent. And go on YouTube. Kevin L.A. Ewing. I got dreams on witchcraft, dreams on dead people. You name it. You go on there. All of my videos are there. People say to me all the time, man, you know, I ain't on Facebook. Okay, fine. You got to be on Facebook. Go on YouTube. Visit my blog site. I have over 500 articles. Most people that know me found me through my blog site. I hear all the time, Kevin, one night I was home, I was so frustrated, I feel like stuff was going on, and I just went on the internet and I type in spirit, I type in this, and that's how I get to know you. Your article came up, and that's how I read your stuff, and it was life-changing for me. God has inspired me with the gift of writing and to write from a spiritual perspective. Kevin, L-A-Ewing.blogspot.com. When I come off, I will post this video. I will send a link of my... YouTube site to my page. I will send a link of my blog site. Send it to others. Send it to others. There are many people right now who probably need to watch these videos, who need something realistic, something they can uh, be in tune with, something that will speak to them. No more hooping and hollering, but really breaking down the Word of God to speak directly to your spirit. Anyway, that's it for me. Uh, I pray that you all have a good night. I pray that the, the whole armor of God upon you for the mere reason that it is for, and that is to cause you to stand against the wiles of the devil. Amen.